Last time we talked about something that hey, I thought it's pretty interesting, and it's how people are turning away from institutions that they no longer trust and turning to individuals that they do trust, especially for information. And I think it's going to be really important for all of us to develop our, our list of people we trust. And maybe that's where Twitter, X, whatever it is now, Maybe that's where it really shows its value in the future is because we can follow certain individuals. Maybe that's where we keep our lists at of people we trust. Okay, and somebody I, I've been following for a little while now, but more so recently, um, David B. Collum. Okay, I'll leave a link below to a podcast with the interview with him on just economic stuff. Okay, really sharp guy. Um, he's really down to earth, really simple, but when I say smart, he's a chemistry professor at Cornell. Okay, but anyway, I, I think he's worth listening to. All right, so he's one of the individuals on my list, and I just downloaded X. Hey, I want to support Elon. If he's trying to promote free speech, I'm all for it. And I do want to work on developing my own list of people I want to follow. Okay. Well, something else I think we're going to need to do going into the future is we're going to need to go back to books. Books and manuals. Okay? And the reason for that, the information age, digital technology, is turning into something that we can no longer trust it either. Or, or at least we can no longer trust the software companies that are producing software. Okay, I know that's a bold claim that it's getting to where we can't trust digital technology, but okay. And for myself, I remember when computers first came out, our personal computers, when they were first getting popular anyway in the early 80s, and that was just amazing for all of us. Okay, and the amazing part was how much information we could store in such a small place, storing it digitally. So. Well, the hard drives were so small then, you could store an entire book, as long as it's in a really simple file format, on a hard drive. Hard drives got bigger than us on personal computers, and the well, next thing you know, we can store a lot of information on a computer. Then comes the internet. Okay, so it connects all of these servers and computers that are storing tons of information. So all of a sudden now, we can access this information from anywhere where we can connect to the internet. So now we can access an entire library over a personal computer. Hey, that was amazing. All right. And we were just so naive then too. Okay, it just I don't think any of us thought about the potential downfalls of where this could go in the future. No one debit cards came out, some of us we had a few concerns, okay. All right, but we just didn't think that much about it. Well, now times have changed. Okay, now it's seriously getting to where we can't trust. It isn't the digital technology, and when I say it's the software companies, all of, all of the companies, well, first of all, they all want their own proprietary file formats. Okay, so if you want to access this file, and it could be work that you have created using their software. Well, if you want to access that file, you've got to pay them money. It's becoming subscription-based for everything now, or at least as many companies as can are going to a subscription base. So as far as I'm concerned, it's extortion. Used to, we bought a installation CD, we installed it on our computer. If the computer crashed and burned, we still had the inst installation CD, we install it on our next computer. All right, well, that only works until operating systems get updated to the point that that installation CD no longer works on an up-to-date operating system. Okay, and, and unless you've got a very old computer that you've managed to keep running and it, you're still on an older operating system. Okay, and for myself, I need to look more into Linux. I haven't fooled with Linux in a long time. I need to see if Ubuntu's kept up with updates and so forth, but open source software is what I'm talking about. And 
that was a good alternative for a lot of things in the past, and maybe it still is. Again, I just haven't kept up with it. Okay, I used to be a lot more computer savvy than I am now. All right, but now with all, so many companies, software companies going to subscription-based services, that none of the information is ours anymore. If we can't open a file without their software, okay, well this isn't just limited to software. Car companies are going to subscription-based services if you want to use features on the car. Or if you want those automatic high beams to work, or you want your heated seats to work, you've got to pay a subscription. Or they will turn that off. And the argument, and I love this, their argument is, well, there's no use in you paying the full price for heated seats when you're not going to use them, say, in the summertime. Or maybe you live in a different climate than the original owner and you just don't need heated seats, so there's no point in you paying for that. So you can just get a subscription and save money. That is the stupidest thing I think I've ever heard in my life because you've already paid for the damn heated seats when you bought the car. <laughs> the hardware's there. All the digital technology that's now in all of the cars did was give them the means to make your hardware that you've already paid for inoperable. Let's see it. And, it was similar to what Windows did with um, XP a while back. They had the Home Edition and then the Professional, I think. Okay, when you installed the Home Edition, all of the features that were on the Professional Edition were still installed on your computer. It's just locked out so you couldn't use it. Okay, well, they've already developed all of that technology. At that point, they're just withholding features to get more money out of you. Okay, and... That works for strict software. Okay, I can see them doing that for just straight up software. But then to make it so that you can't use hardware, okay, that's taking it to another level. Okay, that's where it's going to. And what was it, Colorado, not that long ago, they had a heat wave and a lot of the customers had signed up to get a discount on their energy bills by using uh, digital thermostats and it turns out there was, an, there was a user agreement that went along with that, which gave the power company permission to control the thermostat. So the state or whoever said there was a heat wave, and the power company literally turned people's thermostats up so they didn't use as much power during the heat wave. And people had zero control over the thermostats in their home at that time. Okay, so none of us saw that digital technology going in this direction, but that's the direction it's going in. And as we become more dependent upon digital technology, we're just at the mercy of whoever, all right? And then they can extort however much money out of us as they see fit. Okay, now, the other downside to digital technology, it's not permanent. Okay, and we all knew it wasn't permanent. I, I remember years ago I started storing so many things on the computer. I would scan it into with a scanner, pictures and things like that. And I always made copies. I always had backups just because, you know, stuff happens. We all know it to disk and hard drives and everything else. But it never crossed my mind that I might not be able to access those files one day. Okay. Well, in addition to that not being permanent, with this book, what's written in this book right here, it's not going to change. I mean, this, this never changes. The book could get destroyed in a fire or whatever, but with this book or any book that is this edition, they all have the same print. Okay, what well, if this were a digital book, this could say one thing one day and something entirely different the next, and nobody knows the difference. Okay, well, the danger there is there's no accountability. I mean, okay, th this had the wrong thing written in it. it, it whatever the information was, it's just flat out wrong. Okay, I come back later, it causes a problem, I complain to the company, and I'll, no, it's, they can say, no, it's not wrong. Prove it was wrong. I go find that page and, oops, it was changed. 
Okay, well, what happens when newspapers start doing that? What happens when newspapers start making corrections to articles where they just flat out lied in the past and they never announced that it was a correction or anything? It's just whatever article got updated. Or what happens in, in the future when that article's gone? Okay, and that's something else. Okay, YouTube. We know there are so many great videos on YouTube, how-to videos and everything else. And so many of us have, we turn to the videos now instead of having the old user manuals and things like that. Well, we just all assumed we would always be able to access those videos. But now with the search feature being as bad as it is on YouTube now, it's just getting so much harder to find information. Okay, well, None of us ever thought that, hey, maybe one day we just won't even be able to find really good information that's out there. And we know it's out there. We saw it before. We can't find it now. Okay, so what we're even able to access or able to find, we're depending on Google and YouTube and Bing and DuckDuckGo and whoever search engines. I could actually, and search has gotten so bad at this point, I could actually see the need for an old Yahoo style search coming back. And Yahoo used to be a directory. It never was really a search, it was a directory. Okay, well, if we have actual individuals updating directories to make sure there's good information there, that could be really useful for as bad as search is getting now just because there's so many bots and so much uh, search, engine optimi search engine optimization and then um, uh, spam out on the internet. It's just getting so difficult to find good sites and information and so forth. So, and back to that whole trust thing. A directory, that, hey, that could be useful. Okay, well, and getting back to the no accountability now. Okay, what happens when they start changing the meaning of words? Literally. Okay, that's the meaning of words is a very important thing. I mean, we've got things like the First Amendment. Okay, the Second Amendment. All the others. What happens when Webster is changing the definition of words for, based on political ideology? Not what the word commonly means in use and so forth, but due to straight political ideology. Okay, and there's, guess what? They've already done it for a lot of words. Okay, so what does exactly what exactly does the Constitution mean now if the definitions of those words don't mean what they meant five minutes ago? I mean that's what law is. It's literally law is based on words. And it only works so long as the definitions of the words stay consistent. Well how, with digital technology Anybody can change definitions at any time, depending on who's defining the word. Whereas with an actual dictionary, it's in print. We can all go back and reference that. If we've got the same edition, we all get the same definition. Okay, somebody can't just change it with the, you know, an, an enter button and a few clicks of a mouse. We, all of us need to find individuals we trust. Talked about that. Well, I think we also need to start building up our collection of books that we trust now. Okay, we can always access those books. The information's always going to be good. It's always going to be relevant. Most importantly, it's always going to be true. Okay, and for myself, I mean, I've just absolutely been getting rained out here lately, so construction on the new house is still at non-existent, but Okay, so that just means I've got plenty of time to dream about what I want on the remodel that I'm currently trying, wishing I was able to do. And one of the things I was thinking is I need bookcases. Okay, that's something I really want in the new house, built-in bookcases, because I do want books. I do see, I see a value for books going into the future now that a year ago, I, six months ago, a week ago, I, I couldn't have imagined books being as valuable as they're going to soon be, I do believe. At, with the direction we're going in, with the software companies, with the 
subscription-based everything with uh, Webster's changing definitions of words for based on ideology with search engines getting so bad, not being able to find information. I think that's really going to be valuable, son. Okay, now whether or not it is, I don't know, but I would sure hate five years from now all of a sudden can't access or either we can't find the information we need or the information we need is just so bad it's useless. Books could really come in handy again. And the thought of digital technology, I think the information age is over. We're in the misinformation and disinformation age now. I'm just, it's all about making money at this point. And morals and values are pretty much out the window. And we're not even going to get into hackers and um, all of the viruses and everything else. So, yeah, it's a good time to start putting up together a list of books along with the individuals who want to follow. And this was something I just stumbled across a couple of weeks ago. Um, the Calls, that's the guy, name of the guy's web, uh, YouTube site. And I can't remember his name right now. It's um, a French last name, Pierre. Anyway, I'll leave a link below. And it's really interesting. What he's doing is he's going through a 50 volume set of the Harvard classics. All right, so the president of Harvard University, which this is just so ironic after we talked about issues with Harvard last time. The president of Harvard University in 1909, 1910, put together a 50 volume set of the essential readings, the classics. All right, he's going through those. It's very valuable, and that's back to books. We're talking original sources here. Okay, that's another thing we get with books that we don't get with digital. We get the original source that we don't have to worry about, was this altered? Was it, um, is it a fake? Okay, and especially now with AI and deep fakes. I mean, we're fixing to hit a whole new level, not only of not being able to trust what we see on the internet, but also of being manipulated by what is out there. I mean, there's gonna be computers smarter than we are figuring out how to manipulate us. That's when we're really going to need individuals we can trust. And when I say individuals, you personally wouldn't have had to have met them, but you need a friend who did, who met them in real life to know that they are real. All right, we're getting to that point quick. What well, the books are going to go right along with that. If it's not a book, you're holding it in your hands. You're reading original sources. You're not going to be able to trust the information. Okay, and we can already see what they're doing with history, trying to rewrite history. Okay, the, what was it, the, the 1649 project? I forget what that nonsense was called, but I mean, it, it was based on absolutely nothing, and it, it's complete, total made up nonsense. And then some schools are implementing that as part of their curriculum for history, and for what little bit of history they actually teach now. So. What is history if we don't have original sources and we can access those? Because we can't trust anything that comes out now anywhere from anyone, especially in an institution. Okay, so someone writes about 1649 Project. That we can't trust that unless we can go back and find original sources and verify it. And even with what little bit I know, I know that's nonsense, what was written in that. But most people don't. Okay, without those original sources, I mean, people, institutions, they can say whatever they want to was history. They can make up whatever facts, whatever, I say facts, whatever lies they want to and say that that was a historical fact and there's no way for anybody to either prove it or disprove it. So, literally, the digital age would mean the death of history if the original books aren't there. Okay, well, going forward, did Francis Yamamoto, I think that was his name, anyway, wrote a book in the late 90s and 
the name of it was the end of history. Okay, and his whole rationale was the Soviet Union collapsing, that that was the end of war and everything was going to be perfect for now, and history was essentially based on conflict, and therefore there was no more history because no more conflict or something like that. Okay, going forward, if there's no books, is there any history? <laughs> I mean, I think he nailed it. It really was the end of history. But not because the end of wars or anything like that. It's because it was the end of actual information that someone could go change at will to say whatever they wanted it to say at any time. It was an actual permanent written record. Anyway, something to ponder there. I think that there is objective reality, contrary to what the postmodernists and the communists say. And I think those of us that are more in touch with reality, I think we're going to be a lot better off than those that aren't. Okay, so if we're at least aware of the notion that there could be some serious economic problems in the near future, I think we're going to be in a lot better shape than those that just get completely blindsided by economic issues we might run into here soon, like a depression. Okay, and, I, and I'm not saying a depression is going to happen or imminent or anything else. I just think it's a very real possibility. Okay, and just at least being aware that it's possible, we're in better shape. And then if we can follow individuals that are giving us credible, truthful information, I think that's beneficial to us. We can make better decisions based on that information versus people that are just living in a bubble that just have completely lost touch with reality. Okay, and then throw in with all of that books. So we have factual information that really good books that the information has been verified. We know we can trust that information and it's always accessible to us. So yeah, I think this is stuff worth keeping up with and for myself personally over the next few months, I want to work on putting together a list of individuals I trust along with books that I think are important and then here in a few months, I, I'll share that with all of you because right now books are just cheap insurance. They're easy to get. Very few people want them, especially when we start talking used books. And again, they're always accessible and available. Even if there's a brownout and the electrical company cut off your power because you know they're afraid of starting a forest fire. <laughs> you can still light a candle and read a book. <laughs> all right, this you know, something else to think about. God bless and have a great day.